Hey there, welcome. Today we're gonna to talk about minerals and minerals are really important. Not only do they make up the rocks that make up the entire planet that we are sitting on, but minerals are also something that are crucial to our everyday lives. They make up the different parts, uh, the components of our cell phones. They make up our jewelry. They make up some of the food that we eat, believe it or not. You actually eat some minerals. Uh, and they also make up um, things like wallboard, construction materials, paint. Everything that we use uh, kind of comes from the earth around us. And that earth is fundamentally at the basic level made of these things we call minerals. Now, what the heck is a mineral? A mineral uh, has five basic characteristics, and we're going to talk through them quick, and then we'll write like the big fancy science definition for what a mineral is. So we have several things. Uh, number one, minerals have to be naturally occurring. They have to exist in nature. They can't be something that a scientist makes in a laboratory, okay? They have to exist out there in the real world either on the Earth or they could be somewhere like the moon or on an asteroid or somewhere out in the universe naturally occurring. Number two, they have to be inorganic. And that's just a fancy science word for something that is not living, something that's not alive. And so um, it can't be anything that is living or is the remains of something that's been living. And we'll come back and talk about that more when we talk about different rock types. A mineral has to be a solid. So liquids and gases don't count. Uh, and uniform solid means that it's basically the same material everywhere. Um, so if I pick up a piece of, let's say, the mineral quartz from over here, and I pick up a piece of quartz from over there, they're essentially the same basic stuff. Number four, uh, you've got to have a definite chemical composition to be a mineral or have a, a specific chemical formula that we can write down. For example, the mineral quartz has the chemical formula SiO2. The Si is one atom of silicon and the O2 part is two atoms of oxygen. And Everywhere quartz exists, this is what it's made of. It's always one little atom of silicon connected to two little atoms of oxygen. They're always there together. They're always bonded together in the same way. And so every time I have quartz, I know that the chemical formula of that quartz is SiO2. It's, it's definite, always. Now, not only is quartz always SiO2, but the mineral quartz, like all minerals, also has an orderly crystal structure, which means that those atoms are put together in the same way in all the quartz in all the world. And so when I pick up a piece of quartz, it's always basically the same stuff. Now, it may look a little different. It may have a different color. You know, there may be some things about it that don't look exactly the same. But if I was looking under a microscope, I would be looking at the same atoms made up in the same way. Okay. And that's what makes a mineral a mineral. Now, putting all of this together, we can come up with the definition of a mineral. And it's only a one little sentence here. But if you think about everything we've just said, almost every word in this definition means something. Um, a mineral is a naturally occurring, inorganic solid with a definite chemical composition and an orderly crystal structure. And these characteristics of each mineral make each mineral look different, have different physical properties different chemical properties, these characteristics of the mineral make the mineral what it is. You can see here's a picture with a bunch of different minerals. Um, some of them are very familiar and I'll bring some minerals in here in the next week or two and we'll take a look at some of these. 
And some of them I, I don't have examples of. I do not have any diamonds, I'm very sorry to say. Uh, and so uh, I do have some of the stuff that isn't as like valuable, but I don't have some of the stuff like that's super valuable. So look, notice how each mineral looks different. Each mineral looks very sort of unique. And one of the big things when you're learning to become a geologist who studies the earth is one of the first things you do is learn to identify different minerals. Because once you know what the minerals look like, the common minerals, then you can start to identify the rocks that they make up. Because minerals put all together make rocks. And once you understand the rocks and can identify those, then you can start to tell the story of where these rocks came from and what was happening on and inside the earth. And geology really becomes storytelling. It becomes learning about and reading the, the minerals and the rocks and telling the story of the history of our planet, of our world. Now, how do we learn to identify those minerals? Well, it's not as simple as you might think because there are, as of today, um, over 2,400 different minerals. Nobody can just look at every single mineral and just identify it and know exactly what it is because there's just too many possibilities. But we're very lucky in that only eight or 10 of those minerals make up most of the rocks that we see at the surface of the earth. And so we don't have to learn 2,400 <laughs> minerals. We have to learn like eight or 10. And we'll talk more about what we call the rock forming minerals later. Um, and you will get to learn a little bit about how to figure out what you're looking at when you see them. Now, each mineral, when we are trying to identify it, we look at its unique combination of properties things we can observe. Physical properties are things that we can observe with our senses, like we can see it, we can touch it, we can smell it, we can taste it. Yes, we taste rocks. <laughs> um, and uh, those physical characteristics, those are very accessible to us. We can, we can basically look at those all the time. There are some other chemical properties that, that you might need to be in a lab for, or you might need to have some special tools for. And we'll just talk about a few of those. Um, they're important when they're important, but they're very often, they're, they're not easy to test for if you're just out looking at rocks out on the earth. And so we generally rely on the physical properties to identify them in the field out there when we're actually looking at the rocks. So let's talk about some of those physical properties first. Number one, the most obvious thing when we look at a rock or when we look at a mineral um, is usually the color. What color is it? And minerals, some of them are so beautiful. That's, they make up the gemstones that we wear in our jewelry. Um, things like sapphires that are blue and beautiful or rubies that are red, emeralds that are bright, beautiful green. Um, many minerals like amethyst are purple. Um, fluorite, uh, many of the copper minerals that Arizona has a lot of these copper minerals are some kind of shades of blues and greens, like the malachite. This is malachite right there on the bottom right. Uh, that's a mineral that we have a lot of in Arizona. Azurite is blue. Um, and turquoise is also a copper mineral and turquoise has that it's its own color it's turquoise um, it's got that beautiful blue green color and it's so important um, to many cultures minerals come in every color they can be yellow they can be metallic or not metallic we'll talk about that in a minute it's not really a color but the color gets a little hard to talk about without talking about the metallic look to things um, but um, gold or silver, you, there is a color involved in that. And, uh, you know, some colors are much more popular and some minerals are clear. Quartz is often clear, so it doesn't really have a color, but the fact that it's clear and colorless is its color. Now, color is probably the first thing we see. The 
one thing we see, but we don't often like consciously think about it is what's called the luster. And the luster has to do with how light bounces off of the mineral. Sometimes the the light just kind of goes straight on through and something is translucent and has what we call a glassy or a vitreous is a big word that means glassy, <laughs> luster. Um, this would be things like quartz. Uh, and it's almost like window glass, you know, and, you know, and if you turn the, the crystal right, you can see a flash of light, but in other directions, the light goes right on through it, or you can see into the mineral. Metallic is another one. We know what a, a metallic luster looks like. You know what a metal is versus what something is that's not a metal. It's got that metallic shine to it, that look. Um, where the light, all the light is bouncing off the surface and you, it just has that metallic look to it. Um, metallic and glassy are two of the ones that immediately we tend to notice. But there are two other really common ones too. One is called earthy, which is kind of like when no light is coming off of it at all. Earthy luster looks like dirt, <laughs> okay? It looks like a, a bunch of junk. Like it's not shiny, it's not pretty, it's not sparkly. It's just earthy. Um, and lots of minerals have that earthy luster. They don't look shiny and sparkly and pretty. They just look like, like earth stuff. And one that's very famous and common um, is pearly luster. And this is what pearl looks like or mother of pearl. Um, we will be looking at some big sheets of mica when I bring my minerals in that I collect. And like mica, muscovite, um, biotite, those have a pearly luster. Uh, a lot of pearly luster minerals are actually used in makeup. So they literally take some of the stuff, they grind it up, and they put it into your eyeshadow or blush or highlighter has that like little bit of pearly look to it on your cheekbone when you put it on, you know. Um, and so it's a very commonly used thing in makeup products, among other things. Um, these are the big ones. Uh, there are some other lusters, but these are the ones that you're going to want to know. Metallic, glassy, earthy, and pearly luster. And that's just what the, what's the light doing? Now, the next one is called cleavage, and cleavage is really important out in the field where you're trying to decide between, let's say you have a mineral and it's kind of clear, kind of like, you know, there's not a lot to go on there. If you can see cleavage on that mineral, a lot of times you can immediately tell what it is. Now, cleavage is how the mineral breaks. If you smack it with a hammer, how does it break? If you drop it, how does it break? Many minerals, because the atoms are arranged in a very specific way inside of them, they will have planes of weakness, flat surfaces where the bonds between the atoms are very weak. And so if you smack the mineral or break it, it will break on flat surfaces kind of naturally. And that's what we call cleavage. Um, some minerals like the micas, which you'll see what I mean when I bring this in, they have perfect one directional cleavage. They break perfectly in one direction. Um, others like salt, if you take a little look at salt, um, if you put a little salt in your hand tonight when you're home, and you look close at it, salt is made of little cubes. It has perfect 90 degree angles. Um, so salt, it's a mineral called halite. It's one sodium and one little chlorine atom bonded together. And it has that 90 degree angle of cleavage on it. And so it's real easy to tell what salt is in the field because number one you can taste it but number two you can see the little 90 degrees whereas you can have something that looks almost identical almost but when you look at it 
the angles are not at 90 degrees. Maybe they're more like a 60, 120 degree angle, like 120 and 60 degrees. That might be calcite, which is a very common mineral. And it looks just like halite, like table salt, except that it doesn't have those 90 degree angles. It has slightly different angles. So we look really close to figure out exactly what does the cleavage look like. Um, it doesn't always help, uh, but for some minerals, it's everything. It tells you exactly what you're looking at. Here's another example. Here you can see um, this is mica, and it's got that one direction of perfect cleavage. It actually will break in sheets. Um, these right here, this is a beautiful calcite. You can see it's got that, that 60, 120, um, kind of cleavage there. This one's a little harder to see, but this I believe is supposed to be a 90 degree angle. I think that's, that's a big chunk of salt, of table salt. We'll see some more examples. Once you actually see this, it'll make sense. Now, not every mineral has cleavage because not every mineral has weakness areas in its crystal structure, in the way that the atoms are arranged inside. Many uh, minerals just break however they break and there's no pattern to it. We call that fracture. Um, it's just random. It just breaks how it breaks because of how you smack it. <laughs> uh, and if the mineral doesn't have cleavage, it has fracture. Uh, the most common kind of fracture is um, the kind of fracture that we get in things like obsidian or flint. Uh, and indigenous people and, and our human ancestors, they made use of this property to do flint napping and to actually, you can strike and you can hit rock, certain rock types, the, in certain ways and you can create very sharp edges so you can have scrapers and you can have axes and you can make beautiful arrowheads that are very sharp um it's a lost art that that not a lot of people learn to do today but it's fascinating when you really look at how much effort and artistry it takes to really take a, a stone that you just pick up and turn it into a tool um, which is one of the major things that, that we do as human beings. We make and use tools. Um, so we'll take a look at some of this different fracture type. Uh, and this is called, this curved surface, like broken glass, is called conchoidal. Oh boy, I'm not going to be able to spell it. Oh boy, yeah. I don't know how to spell it. I think that H is in the wrong place, but it's something like that. I'll, I'll spell it for you in the classroom. How's that? Um, streak is another important strange property of a mineral. Uh, the streak, and who knows how somebody discovered this, but they did. The streak is the color the mineral makes if you scratch it on a piece of unglazed porcelain. Uh, a piece of unglazed porcelain would be like the underside of a sink, um, a white sink that's made of porcelain that is not sealed, doesn't have the shiny surface on it. And we, we carry out in the field, a geologist carries little plates, um, just little squares of, of unglazed porcelain. And for a few minerals, this is really important because they might look bright silver or they might look dark black. But if you scratch them, they may have a reddish scratch uh, this is hematite. That's a mineral that is iron ore. And iron ore, which is our major source of iron, hematite, it has this reddish brown streak. And if you see that, you know immediately it's hematite. This is iron ore. <laughs> because it's the one it just it's the one that looks like that. And nothing else really looks like that. And it does not matter if hematite can look all kinds of different ways. When you see it, it can be sparkly like this little picture in, on the screen. It can be black. It can be dull. It can have earthy luster or almost metallic luster. 
it looks really different. But as soon as you scratch it on the plate, you see that orange or that reddish orangey brown streak and you know what you have. Um, others have a black streak or a white streak or a pale, like a greenish gray streak. And so it, it's not something that every mineral you know, shows up this way, but occasionally for certain minerals, this is what tells you what you're looking at. Oh, there we go. Um, hardness. Now, hardness is important because some minerals are very hard, like diamonds, and other minerals are so soft that we can scratch them with a fingernail, and you'll get to do this. Uh, the hardness is not what you necessarily think it is though. Hardness is how resistant a mineral is to being scratched, not to being broken. Diamonds are the hardest substance that we know of in nature, okay? They, nothing can scratch a diamond except for another diamond. And so that means the diamond is very hard and that's one reason that it's sort of become a symbol in many human cultures of love or marriage or something that lasts a long time, ideally. Um, but the truth is diamonds are very breakable. They're very brittle, meaning they fracture, they break very easily, but they don't scratch at all. <laughs> so hardness isn't about how breakable something is. It's about how like how resistant is it to scratching and a guy named mo uh and we'll see this on the next screen kind of went through this whole process where he got a whole bunch of different minerals and he was scratching them all on all the other minerals and he actually created a scale from one to ten from the softest mineral that you can scratch with your fingernails you can actually scratch it with your skin <laughs> um to the diamond, which is the hardest. You can't scratch a diamond with anything except another diamond. And then we can figure out where we are at, what kind of mineral we're looking at if we can figure out where does it fit into the scale? Is it a five or a six or a seven? You know, that helps us identify certain minerals. Now, the scale is called Mohs Hardness Scale. And it goes from one, which is the softest mineral, to 10, which is the hardest mineral. The softest mineral is talc. And talc is actually has been used for a lot of years in some baby powder. Now, ideally, you should not actually use talcum powder that is made of talc. There is some evidence because of how talc forms that um, that talc and therefore talcum powder, if you're breathing it in all the time and, and using it and rubbing it on yourself and stuff, it can get inside your lungs and it can actually maybe cause certain types of cancer. Um, so most of what we call baby powder or talcum powder today is actually made of cornstarch. But in the olden days when I was growing up, it was made of powdered rock. <laughs> so you just put this powdered rock all over yourself. Um, and uh, it was called talcum powder. And, uh, and I'm, you can still buy it today, I think. I don't know. You might want to check if you have baby powder at home. You're probably going to see it's made of cornstarch. But you might want to check that. Um, gypsum is number two. This is a material that um, is in a lot of drywall. Gyp board, it's called sometimes. And we use it in a lot of building materials. It also makes some really pretty gemmy type stuff, um, but it's too soft. So we don't wear it in rings. We don't use it for like jewelry because you can scratch gypsum with your fingernail. Your fingernail is about a 2.5. Um, and I'll give you the opportunity to scratch some gypsum up um, later when I bring my stuff in. Number three is calcite. Number four is fluorite. Number five is apatite. The enamel on your teeth is, um, it's what's called a polymorph of apatite. 
uh, and don't worry about the polymorph thing. But this is about about 5 to 5.5 is how hard the enamel on your teeth is. And that's the hardest substance in your body. Um, orthoclase feldspar is number six. Quartz, which is the most common mineral at the surface of the earth, is number seven. Topaz is eight. Corundum is nine. Corundum is actually um, rubies and sapphires. Uh, depending on the color of corundum, if it's gem quality, real clear and beautiful, um, it's called a ruby if it's red, a sapphire if it is uh, blue, an emerald if it's green, I think, yeah. Um, and then diamonds are the hot, the tens. Diamonds are the hardest mineral. Um, we have some kits that we can you can play with, but we don't have any diamond in them. <laughs> uh, diamonds aren't actually that rare. There are industrial quality diamonds that are plenty full, but um, really high quality diamonds are that are large that are gem quality those are pretty rare which is why they're ex one reason they're expensive uh, four common objects that we often use to test how hard other minerals are your fingernail is about a 2.5 a copper penny is about a three the average knife blade is right around um, a five sometimes a little harder depending on the nature of the steel and glass has a hardness of about 5.5, okay? Um, and there's, if you're interested in this, there's other lists online that you can go and find that list all kinds of stuff. These are the major physical properties. Color, luster, how the light hits it. Cleavage, how does it break? Fracture, does it just break randomly? Streak. What color does it make if you scratch it on a piece of porcelain that's unglazed? And hardness, how resistant is it to being scratched by all the stuff around it? There are a few other properties that are important. There are some minerals that are magnetic. The main one is called magnetite. Um, some minerals react to hydrochloric acid, so if you drop acid on them, they bubble. Calcite is the big one here. Specific gravity, we're not going to worry about that. Some of them, and you guys, this is the coolest. <laughs> some of them glow under a black light. This is, this is the best. Check this out. Some minerals have atoms and elements in them that if you hit them with an ultraviolet light or what we call a black light they will phosphoresce or they'll glow or luminous and they can glow red or yellow or orange or bluish purple or greenish like there's all these different colors and that's a property of the mineral that lets you know what you're looking at um this is really really cool Here's a couple of them. This right here, the top, um, this is what the mineral looks like under normal light. Uh, and you can see they just look like your average rocks, right? They're kind of like grays and whites and like not a lot of exciting stuff there. But if you put the exact same rock underneath black light, or UV ultraviolet, you see something totally different. This whole thing right here becomes this whole thing right here. And notice it doesn't look like, it all looks like this white patch, but notice there's some, there's these little bits of different mineral that are kind of staying bluish. And then you're getting some that's turning green. And then you're getting some little bits that are turning red. And it helps you identify how many different minerals you've got. Here's a beautiful lots and lots of reds here. But also right in here, there's something that's green. Um, so anyway, this is really cool. We used to have a black light. Um, it was stolen. And so we used to be able to show you guys this in person. Um, if I can ever get a hold of one, I will bring it in and show you some stuff. We still have the rocks. We just don't. The black lights that, that you use for this are pretty expensive. 
um, and we just don't have one anymore, which is really sad because they're so cool. And that is your introduction to minerals. You are going to get to put your hands on some. You're going to get to see them and play with them and just sort of, you know, look at the different properties. And, um, and hopefully it will help you see the world around you a little different. And you will never look at a rock the same way because rocks are made up of individual minerals all stuck together. And so if you look carefully at a rock, sometimes you can identify some of the minerals that make it up. And that helps us tell the story of the earth.